Well, one of the most vexing issues on any council table is the task of setting the rates. Super City Auckland has to move to a common rating system this year to complete the integration plan. That means reductions for some, but a big double-digit increase for others. The Mayor is seeking government cooperation to cap the increase for them, initially at 10%, and then face the rest of it in over time. But the Council's Communities and Residents Ticket wants a different approach, a flat rate increase of 2.5%, a general annual charge for every property owner of $450, and some cuts and delays for some of those big ticket items in the Council's long-term plan. Just another example of the differences around the Council table. Well, CNR leader Christine Fletcher joins us now. Well, Christine, welcome. Thank you, David. Tell me, you're, you're an experienced councilman. You, you've chaired council meetings. What level of comfort do you have with the actual long-term plan that Auckland just has? I've got some very real concerns insofar as I think it's already out of date. I mean, a 10-year... This is a 30-year plan or something, isn't it's it? It's a 10-year plan. It's be out of date. It's the 10-year plan, the 10-year funding plan. And yes, I have to say, I think it's already out of date. It's out of date because so much of it is predicated on the central rail loop, which I actually support. But 50% has to come from government. 37% has to come from alternative sources. Um, and so much of the waiting has gone into prioritising that, and yet we know it's unlikely to happen in the short to medium term. So we haven't actually given the prioritisation to the other projects that actually might take the city forward in the meantime, such as electrifying the rail to Pukekohe, for instance. Well, I was going to ask you about the, the priorities, because I mean, one of the things that seems to me is fairly fundamental is having fresh water, is having the sewage carried away. It's having the stormwater drains working and we know <coughs> that across the whole Auckland region there are major problems and there's, they're very expensive problems. Are they getting the priority they deserve? There's a lot of unsexy stuff that just hasn't had the prioritisation. I would argue that we didn't give um, a fulsome analysis to a lot of the legacy council projects that came forward, many of which were signed on the eve of amalgamation, um, and they were just taken as given. And many of those were very, very costly. So they, they brought with them some huge liabilities. Um, we haven't given prioris, prioritisation, in my opinion, sufficiently to across the region spending in terms of equity. A lot of downtown projects. I mean, fabulous to have the shop yeah, front of Auckland. But tell me, please, how does that happen? I mean, that's why we elect councillors. We, we expect you to actually be able to harness the resources of the council and draw up plans that reflect the kind of thing that the people of Auckland will accept as being proper prioritised work for the city. I think there's two deficiencies. One is the government didn't intend, it seems, that we would have contestability. The mayor was to put forward his vision and then somehow it was all miraculously to happen. But I think in, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. Yeah, but have they given and the mayor too much power then? The mayor has a huge amount of power and I see that they're about to confer the power on to every other council around Auckland, uh, around, around New Zealand country. I should say. Yeah. Um, the mayor... It's good that the mayor has executive power, but in terms of the, the, the testing of ideas and the testing and the understanding of the consequences of these plans that he's putting forward, there was no budget, there was no support anticipated for that kind of service, which I would argue is absolutely necessary in terms of getting policy formation this is right. The service to the councillors as opposed to the service to the mayor. Yes, and, okay. and furthermore, I think that the, the CEO who comes from the private sector, takes the view that he is actually very much the CEO to the chairman of a private board. So all of the resources of the council are there quite correctly to serve the mayor and council laws. But if, if in any good policy making situation, you actually want to have alternatives to be able to put up um, uh, those sorts of questions to test these policies then, and test certainly some of those legacy council projects, then it's just seen as um, um, less important. Well, I've been and looking at the council-controlled organisation structures and it seems to me that once upon a time, councillors had a fairly direct relationship with the people who do the work for the council. Yes. Today it seems you've got three, if not four, mm -hmm. layers of 
boards and management between you and the people who do the work on behalf of the council. Well, I think council laws correct? are taking. Yes, it is correct, and I think council laws are taking a while to understand how they can actually influence the work of the CCOs. In that, it's through the statement of intent, which is an agreed contract. Um, but what is fundamentally lacking is the clarity around how much money is actually going to be involved. So councillors can come up with a, a shopping list of all mm -hmm. manner of things that they would like, but if those funds are not there, and what we haven't seen is through the LT pro, LTP process, uh, a very clear understanding of what projects are going to be in and what projects are going to be out. But and how, even how, if that's the, how can you be accountable to the people who elected you? If you don't know that, well, I how think can you actually be accountable? I think it's Probably very, accountable. I think it's very, very difficult. Mm. I find it extremely difficult to face up to the people who elected me in the Albert Eden Rosk Award, knowing that over thirty thousand of them were facing rate increases in excess of twenty percent. Now mm. that's been capped to ten percent, um, but it's just death by strangulation right. because at the end of the three-year period where the caps are going to take place. Um, it's going to actually fundamentally change the mm. shape of the community in which I live. And I find that extremely difficult in terms of accountability. Okay. What is the mechanism for ensuring that the strategies of these council-controlled organisations are actually coordinated? Because in some mm. areas, mm. the function of one will affect the function of another. Is there a structure that even does that job? The Mayor would argue that the Auckland plan is paramount and that overarches all of the strategies of council. But as we are now seeing, um, the funding will never meet the aspirations of the Auckland plan. So if you take a project like the walkway, um, the cycleway walkway, which was anticipated from St Helier's around, uh, uh, around the waterfront, which has been on the books for, for years and years and years, uh, which is the number one proposal uh, in terms of submissions from the public for Waterfront Auckland. Um, you could argue that could be an Auckland transport project, it could be a, a Waterfront Auckland project. Um, it's got lost in, the, in, in that <laughs> what void, about, look, in that great... Um, it there's one happen. example. I want to ask you a very simple one. What happens if Organisation A wants to dig up the road today and Organisation B says, oh, we want to do that next month? Well, Organisation we A both will probably look at its statement of intent periods. and say, I can do this, uh -huh. and they'll go ahead and do it. And, and that's where councillors need to be vigilant. And I would argue one of the biggest failings of this current council is that we have tried to be micromanagers rather than governors of this wonderful region, and we have not sufficiently well delegated the powers that should have gone to local boards, and we have been working in too much detail on micromanagement of, of lesser issues. Let me ask you another thing, and, and this may be an unfair question in a way to you. Oh, David, I'm uh, sure that wouldn't be unfair from you. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the accusation is levelled that the Auckland city mothership is actually exercising too much influence for the outer communities. Can you see that? Um, I would argue that probably the Waitakere uh, mothership is, is also exercising a fair bit of influence on, on other activities, yeah, well, but the, yes I can. I mean, the complaint actually came from Minarewa, let's be honest. <laughs> and, and I would actually share that view. As much as I think that we've really got to fundamentally move a lot of these major transport projects, the introduction mm. of the electric trains for instance, and, and, and some of these very important big projects, that is going to really uh, transform uh, rail as we know it in Auckland. I don't think that gives us an excuse to actually throw so much weight in the downtown area. We're not seeing the funds going out into the region equitably. Mm -hmm. uh, and even other parts of central Auckland, we're not seeing them equitably uh, dispersed. So yes, I would share that concern. Let me ask you also, uh, do you think sufficient resource and autonomy has actually been devolved out to the local boards. No, no, I don't. I think the local boards. The, they live the, with it. The they vision, it. the vision that I thought the Royal Commission had in their recommendations to government was to give the governing body of council 
um, a very high level strategic overview on those big projects that we need to advance and to give a lot more autonomy to the local boards and we have not given the local boards the opportunity to be able to exercise um, I think the decision making in their own communities. What has the change done to the nature of the relationship between the council and Auckland local government and central government? I, I think that it's one issue that we haven't taken sufficient time to reflect on. The governance of Auckland is the committees and those sort of structures are delivered by the mayor. That was part of the package that the government mm -hmm. gave in terms of executive powers to the mayor. The mayor created the governance structure of over 30 panels, forums and committees. And we have been so busy on the treadmill just surviving that we actually haven't taken a step back to say how well is this body performing. But the really important things that are on your agenda actually require partnership between central government and They most and certainly local do. Government. And there's only well, really who, who three... Who that partnership? There's, there's only really three things that we had to do, arguably four. We had to deliver an Auckland plan, we had to deliver a 10-year funding plan to deliver the Auckland plan, and we had to deliver a unitary plan, which is the amalgamation of all of those district plans of the seven legacy then you councils. Had to deliver a common and, rating policy. And a common, I see that as part of the LTP. Yeah. You know, we've kicked for touch now on the unitary plan. You're not going to have a unitary plan before the next election. I don't even know it's what just, it is. It's the, it's the amalgamation of all the district plans. So if you want to add <coughs> a garage, if you want to go and do something in your property, um, you actually need to have a plan because it's through those planning mechanisms that we will actually see the, sh the, the, the shape of our city. And so when you have these decisions about do we want a compact city or do we want to have a sprawling city, we actually need to have a plan to know where we're going. Tell me now this. that plan hasn't been delivered and is unlikely to, to be delivered in the term of this council. Tell and I think that that's a tragedy because central government will not be held to account on those things it should be delivering until we can actually see what the shape of Auckland's going to be. Tell me this. Can you sort this out, or is it going to take some legislative change and another intervention by central government? I think about? central government are to be commended for amalgamating Auckland. I think central government need to, however, 18 months into this, say maybe there's some fine tuning that will make the implementation of this amalgamation work rather better. It was always going to be dif difficult to see the amalgamation inside of a three year period and I think that they should be looking really closely before they go and dish out the same model on other unsuspecting cities around New Zealand. I think they need to have a close look at Auckland and actually look at some fine tuning. Tell me this, in terms of legislative change, do you think it's needed? Because, I mean, you're going to have some legislative change to authorise the rate cap, aren't you? Is there something else that should be attended to in that process? Urgent, compelling, I, change making? I think it comes back to the, the rating to a degree. Is, is capital valuation going to be the most equitable way of seeing Auckland move itself forward into the future. And I think there's going to be such a public outcry come the 1st of August when the rating notices go out for those who haven't been following this rating debate um, that I think government is going to want to intervene actually because I think there will be a lot of very unhappy people when they look at whether or not they can afford to stay in their homes for the future. Unfortunately, we've got officers of council and I suspect members of uh, or bureaucrats in Wellington who believe that capital valuation somehow determines the amount of income coming into every household. And there's just absolutely no relation mm -hmm. between the two. And I look at, in my own community, the, the people of Waterview, Point Chev, who suddenly their properties have become very much more fashionable, properties that they might have lived in for 30, 40 years. Asset rich, cash poor. Cash, very, very limited. And so you're predicting significant I Change think there's going to be a lot of heartache, and, heartache. and at mm -hmm. the moment um, there's only a rates rebate that you can apply for up to $500. Many of these people are paying rates in the thousands and thousands of dollars and even if you're talking about um, percentages of rating increase, we're talking about thousands of dollars for people on fixed incomes and I 
feel very seriously disturbed about how that is going to change the face um, of our community. I and feel a very interesting August review coming on. I do too. <laughs> Christine Fletcher, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, David. Christine Fletcher, leader of the Communities and Residents Ticket on the Auckland Super City Council. Well, that's all for now. We're back with more newsmakers and shapers in a week's time on the Beats and Interview. Till then, thanks for your company and see you soon. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.